And greetings, everyone, and welcome to East Meets West at the Vice. Today, the 20th of March, Eric Austin, Austin is going to do Sedgy's Cripple. And I'm Al Beatty, and I'll be doing the KX Emerger. If you've never heard of it before, that's because you've probably never seen it before. Anyway, I'm Al Beatty from Boise, Idaho, and my dear friend, Eric Austin from back east. I don't know where he's claiming as his hometown is now, but he's joining me as well in his, from his new home. Yeah, I'm down in Tampa, Florida now. It used to be Delaware, Ohio, but uh, moved to Florida. Uh, and you're in the in the southeast area. So you've been telling us before we got started uh, a little bit about this fly pattern that you're going to be working on. And I would like it a lot if you would just go ahead and continue. Um, and I'll just kind of back away and let you have the spotlight. Yeah, we'll, we'll do. Um, the fly I'm going to tie today is uh, a pattern that was introduced to our group by Seiji Sato from Japan. Seiji Sato is a master fly tire, a fly fisherman, and an incredible photographer. He has made his living fly fishing his entire life. Uh, he's in his mid-60s and uh, is the most incredible fly fisherman I've ever seen. And he designed these patterns. I think I think they're original with him. I don't know that for a fact. Do designed these for Henry's Fork and for the slow-moving side channels on the Missouri, which is where we like to fish, uh, flat water. It's a very much a flat water fly. And um, let me show you a few just a, a few cripples I've done in the past. This is the original Quigley cripple. This is used um, in the in the in the West, of course. Uh, Qu Quigley uh, designed. He didn't design this. It was uh, the the apocryphal story is that um, he one of his humpies came apart on the Fall River out west, and uh, the uh, deer hair was extending over the eye. He fished the fly anyway and started having tremendous success. So we refined the uh, the whole idea. And um, this is uh, a fly that is fished everywhere um, and very popular in the east as well as as well as the west. This, of course, is the last chance cripple. And this was our go to fly on the Henry's Fork and and on the Missouri uh, for quite a while. Very, I I, uh, I tied, one of the first shows I tied at was in the Catskills for the Th Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers. And of course I didn't want, I knew there were gonna be some great Catskill tires there. So I, I didn't, I decided I wasn't gonna tie Catskill flies and I tied this fly and demoed this fly uh, one of the two days. It was a two-day show, and the other two, the other day, I I, I did a uh, classic Atlantic salmon fly. But uh, this one I handed to a gentleman who had sat patiently and watched me tie it, and he took it out that night and came back all excited. The next day, he caught a fish with it in the Catskills. Uh, this is Sagey's Cripple. Super sparse um, and a very fine body. Finer, I'm going to tie it even finer than this um, today. This isn't this isn't my best example of this fly. And uh, let's get started with it. We call it Sagey's cripple. We don't we don't know if Sagey invented it or not. There's a language barrier. None of us spoke Japanese, not even Dean Umamoto, our Japanese-American part of our group. Um, but uh, let's get going here. But I was able to figure this fly out pretty pretty readily. The uh, the hook is interesting. Um, it's... it's um, a fulling, fulling mill 50-50, and, and I'm tying this in a 16. 
And I left just a little bit of space in front of the eye. And now I'm going to go back to, to where I started the thread. Because this wing, the, the first thing that goes on is the wing and on this one. And um, it's, it's pretty far forward. It's also a pretty tall wing the way Seiji does it. And that's good because this polar CDC is not... Uh, highly visible. It's very wispy. It's 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 perfect for this fly because this fly is so sparse everywhere. Um, we'll we'll hold the the two wings, the two pieces of Polish CDC back to back here. And like I said, we want a tall wing on this. I mean, uh, I'm going to measure this out to about um, hook length. And I think that's about right. Uh, and uh, I don't want to stagger cut this, but very short, because I, I want to find a, a body as I can get. Now, right now, I'm going to tie. Normally, I, I would wait on the... on before tying in the ribbing. But on this fly, because, because I want a, a very fine body, I found that if I tie the ribbing in now, up here at the front, I can save myself one pass with the thread. And as I go back, I want to I want to work this. Let me flatten this thread just a little bit more. I want to work this uh, ribbing over to the far side of the hook. Normally, I I, I tie in all my ribbing on the far side. Um, if you do that, it'll start cleanly when you when you when you wind it. And at this point, I'm going to tie in the shuck and. Seiji does a very fine shuck, and um, he tw it's all twist. It's twisted up. I'll tell you who who else does a fine shuck like this is Wayne Lou Allen. And in order to to maintain the twist. I've, I've used some of Al's dubbing wax. Just put a little bit on throughout throughout this, and then and then twisted it up, and that that keeps keeps it together. Again, just like the wing, pretty pretty long tail on this or sh shuck tail, um, and. On Seiji's flies, it naturally curves up. And if if this is a little too long, and this actually might be a little too long, I'm gonna I'm gonna trim it back. You can just just cut it right there. That's only about a half dozen um, uh, strands of Zelon. Let me get this bound down here. And I've got a little cliff on the body here. I'm going, to, I'm going to smooth that out. Don't want to overdo it, but. And we take this almost all the way to the, to the wing because we're only going to put two turns of hackle on this thing later. Now it's very difficult to uh, to 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 see this. This is crystal flash. 
um, on camera. It's it's pretty easy for me to see it here, but for some reason, it doesn't show up well on my monitor. You want four or five turns of ribbing. It's not critical. Spaced as evenly as you can get them. I've got four on this. I'm trapping it twice, once in front, once behind, once in front, once behind. And the whole idea of that trapping is to try to keep the thread turns to a minimum. By the way, let me show you something. I, 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 let's see if this will work. I don't know if this will work or not. See how much better the ribbing shows up with the light off versus the light on? I learned that trick from tying Silver Doctors. Silver Doctor has a silver uh, flat tinsel body. And then it has a rib of, again, silver oval tinsel. And it's almost impossible to see how the spacing is going unless you turn off the light. If you turn off the light, you can see what you're doing. So keep that in mind, wrapping tinsel. Uh, let's see. We can tie in our... Tackle now. We're going to post up this swing, take a couple turns in front. Didn't leave myself much space. Okay, right there is one full turn of hackle, and right there is the second. Hold the hackle up. Dick Shaw's gonna like this, although he might not. And we're gonna trap the hackle with turns behind, turns in front, and turns behind. Just open the scissors up. And Dick reminded me of that trick. One of our previous conversations. I, I used to do that years and years ago. And uh, I'd forgotten about it. You just, you just push the open scissors through. And three turn whip finish in front and we're done. And that's Sagey's Cripple. That is gorgeous, uh, Eric. And and now I have to go to work a heck of a lot quicker than I thought I would because that went together so fast. Well, I wanted to talk about Sagey just a little bit. So you got you got you still got some time. <laughs> um the guys I fish with, I I, I fish with Bruce Copeland, who, who I've known since nursery school. We grew up in the Adirondacks fly fishing together. And Bruce moved to Bozeman a number of years ago and became a phenomenal fly fisherman while I was out in a band uh, touring bars. But uh, so, so Bruce, I have to admit, Bruce is a little better, a little better fly fisherman than I am. And he's got a good friend, Dean Umamoto, who's also a friend of mine now, um, that he knew in Maryland. I, I met Dean in Maryland when I went there. And uh, and Charlie, of course, Charlie Jordan here. And uh, we have fished together for years. Uh, now we, Tom Wilson has joined our group. And Tom had, had a place on Penn's Creek 
which is another great fishery. It's Lake Henry's Fork in the east. It's it, multiple hatches. It's I love that place. A anyway, Bruce's nephew roomed with Seiji Sato in Japan. He speaks Bruce. Bruce's nephew spoke fluent Japanese. He was killed in an avalanche a few years back, unfortunately. But but he got to know Seiji really well. And Seiji came and fished with us three years ago. And we did Henry's Fork and the side channels of the Missouri, which is what we always do now, pretty much. Uh, we'll, we'll do Spring Creeks every once in a while. Um, and Seiji, honestly... We were all expecting a lot, but he blew our minds. We thought we were pretty good dry fly fishermen, and we we didn't have a clue what that was. Um, it was really eye opening. Um, I'll just tell one one quick story. I've I've told Al a couple already. Um, I mean, there were, just from the one trip, there were all these stories. One of which was. Um, John McDaniel is a guide at Henry's Fork who's been there. He's, he's guided for 35 years. And he had a party. John McDaniel had a party out at Bonefish Flats, which is this flat water, the kind of water we love to fish. Very tough. And he had, and, and these guys, they, they weren't beginners. They were good fly fishermen that he had in his group that day. And they had done nothing all morning. Bruce and Sagey go out there. And within 20 minutes, Seiji had four fish, big fish. I mean, the guy and, and John McDaniel, who's not impressed by pretty much anybody, went over to Bruce and said, Bruce, who's that guy? I mean, Seiji was just incredible. And this fly, um, I'm telling you, this thing is is every bit as good as Seiji is. <laughs> so I highly recommend this. Uh, I, ho I hope you'll tie some up if you fish flat water east or west. Uh, Tom Wilson has taken this fly and fished it on Penn Creek and done great with it. Same fly, you know, uh, which is a PMD imitation, but it doesn't seem to matter. Any any questions about this fly or? So we do have a couple in the chat. Uh, 357 wants to know about the materials list. And Neil wants to know about the colors you use or the thread, shuck, and hackle. There you go. Here's okay, the material. well, materials list, yes. Um, brown thread for the for the body. Um, the uh, the crystal flash ribbing is green. Uh, and everything, everything's brown. Uh, the, the hackle you can use, I, I have to be honest, it looked more like closer to a ginger or a dark ginger that, that Seiji used for this fly. Um, a, but I tied a bunch of them with brown hackle that was kind of, it was whiting and it was kind of half brown. And then the, 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 the not so good side was, was ginger. Which, which you'll see in, in a lot of whiting hackle, kind of two-tone. And I tied them for the guys, and they work great. So I don't think it's ultra, I don't, you know, I don't think it's that important, to be honest, whether it's brown or, or, or ginger. Can I say a couple things? Uh, Excellent. Yes. This is Neil. Um, for sure, that is a great pattern. Um, <laughs> I was just talking to uh, Chuck Ballard, who couldn't be with us today. We were at the Project Healing Waters, and we were talking about flies that you start tying, and then all of a sudden you're into the art of it, and you just keep tying and tying and tying because of the art. And um, the Last Chance Cripple is definitely one of those for me, without a doubt. And I've tied them all the way. I've never tied them as big as 16. I've tied them uh, 18 to 22s. 18s is size. The I, I, for PMDs, I, I tie 18s, period. Right, right. But <laughs> you can tie a beta <laughs> pattern for that. Uh, it'll work well. Um, 
trying to think what else you could you could probably use you could probably go dark with it for uh male trichos coming off just before dark on a on a river but it's just an it's an all-around pattern in this i have found with anything cdc for what it's worth the slower I fish it, like almost stall it out, the more effective it is because you get the movement of the CDC and the air bubbles. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the CD, CDC has, has a magic. Uh, there's there's little doubt, at least. Now, it's not practical for a lot of rougher water. It's just not always practical. Last chance, Cripple, I mean, the, the hair up one, uh, let's see, where is it? That one. Um, that's, this is Harrop's, uh, version of the Quigley, really. Um, right. what a great fly. I mean, and by the way, it works great for betas. It's a terrific pattern for betas tied right. really small, you know? Uh, so, right. I, the, the other thing that works really well for a body is Polish quills. You can oh. get neutral, you can get different colors. Um, I tend to use that a lot when I get really small. I just think they're they're easier to put on, and I don't <laughs> I don't think the fish care. I personally, I think the trigger is the wing and the hackle, and that's it. Yeah, you know I what you disagree. You know, you know a trick you can do if you want to if you want to tie this one really small. The, the um, and I'm, I'm I know you can't see this pointer I'm I'm using, but if you want to tie the last chance in 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 20 or 22 um if you if if instead of using the the um the biot side of the feather of a biot mm -hmm. feather mm -hmm. use use the the other side and it gives you this real fine short body and i hope that's a strand from the other side of the feather the long side mm -hmm. is that uh, eric yeah. This is Lou. Um, you nailed it with that fly because when it was introduced to me, a guy opened his box and he showed it to me and it was identical to what you what you tied. And the only thing I can see where I've done to tweak it for my own is instead of just using regular dry fly hackle, I wrapped CDC hackle to get the, you know, the a little oh. bit of but yeah, it's it's a deadly fly, maybe because it's not been used much. But it's I don't know. Gone under the radar for a long time, and uh, it it really works. It's it's worked for us. That's all I can tell you. Yeah, uh, it's, right. it's a you can also from use it for a comparadon uh, cripple when you're fishing comparadons uh, for um, female trichos coming off in the morning. Okay. Worked great for that. Uh, comment from cool. Jay Lee in the Netherlands. He says, I like the sparse hackle. As many tiny the cripple with way too many hackle wraps. And I'll let you comment on that to Jay, if you would. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I don't know. You know me, Jay. I mean, we're sparse people. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> You Let's know what? If you'd have known he was going to be on, you wouldn't have been using whiting hackle first off. Oh no, 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 no! Big mistake, big mistake. Yeah. Well, Jay, Jay really gets sparse. He he uses a different different kinds of hackle that's less that has uh you know uh, less barb density than the whiting. Um. Yeah, so I so Jay's, Jay's stuff is really <laughs> sparse. And by the way, Jay Jay's Catskill hackle. Jay ties a lot of Catskill style flies and ties them. Just, uh, he's a master as far as I'm concerned. Um, I can't say enough about his his flies. And it's it all comes down to the hackle, man. His hackle is something to be old. It's perfect. So, totally amazing. The, the time I worked at Whiting Farms, we would set it in the lunchroom, having lunch with Tom and brainstorming ways to increase the barb density because that was in our perception quality hackle of course we were tying for a whole much a whole bunch different crowd but anyhow it's interesting no, no it still is i mean i i have no problem with whiting and and 
um, yeah, if you want to float the fly really, really well, um, I don't know that you can beat it. Uh, it's it's yeah. good tackle. Are you ready to wind this up and move on to the next one? Absolutely ready. Okay. Well, then you're all stuck with me. And we are. We may as well take a look at the roadmap fly, just like Eric did a few minutes ago. That's a couple of the cripples that we're going to be tying. And uh, I got a 12 in the vise, and I got one more the size that I would fish. It's an 18. I fish a lot of these in sizes um, uh, 14 through 20. Once in a while, a 22, but mostly these are in the in the in the 14 and smaller. And when I say I fish this, this is a new fly that's never been fished, but I fish it. Well, what I wanted to explain to you is uh, how some inspiration came into my life. And I made a couple of additions to a fly that I used when I was, when I was guiding in Montana on the Spring Creeks and all the same places that Eric talked about. The Henry's Fork, the backwaters of the Missouri. Uh, there are a lot of backwaters that folks don't know about on the Madison below the Bear Trap canyon that uh, is very spring creaky. In fact, there's a section around a place, a part of the area the local guides call the outhouses, uh, which is just, it's the only thing that's there. So that's the, the way you reference them. And there's some incredible spring creek type fishing in all the back channels in that part of the, of the uh, Madison as well. But anyway, taking a look at this fly, uh, it's a, I'm calling it an emerger pattern. And, uh, I want to get into why I'm calling it an emerger, but I want to go to where I got my inspiration. Now, the fly started out as basically this with no rubber legs on it. Let me turn this so you can see the, the rubber, leg, rubber legs I've got there. And with uh, just a body wrapped down into the shank of ways and a, a little tuft of Antron yarn sticking out for for the shuck. What I've done on the shuck that I've never really liked about the shuck that I did on the original pattern is I have brought it together so that it, it was more body shaped even though a shuck as much as a shuck can be. The other thing, make sure I don't neglect to talk about sparkle and the shuck, but we'll get to that in a bit. For right now though, let's take a look at the recipe and then we'll look at the inspiration. Recipe. We call it the KX Emerger. I'll talk about the K, uh, the X. Well, it's got Madam X legs on it. So I forgot I forgot to put that on the, uh, the, uh, the recipe. So my apologies to you all, but there's supposed to be some very fine rubber leg tied on Madam X style. I'm using a scud hook, thread, whatever color you feel like tying it with, because this is a design fly, not specifically for a specific... Uh, insect. <clears throat> it can be in larger sizes as an emerger for larger mayflies or down into the 20s for the little bitty guys, the blue winged olives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the tail is really, a, call it a tail, a shuck, whatever. Anyway, it's Antron yarn and glue. And the reason I glued the end of it, I'll take a quick look here. Um, the reason I glued the end of it is so that it would be more body shaped instead of a tuft of yarn sticking out the back that was square on the on the end. However, as fine as the one that that Eric put on his, um, it, it, as fine as the one Eric put on his fly, there wouldn't be be that kind of a problem. But uh, anyway, back to the recipe. Uh, we're just using peacock dubbing or whatever you want it to be. The hackle is deer hair, or it can be wing, or it can be whatever you want it to be. That's why it's got a question mark. And the head can be deer hair with a question mark. And unfortunately, I left off rubber legs, and they're very fine, as you'll see when I get to that uh, that part of the game. <clears throat> Let's uh, look at the, where the inspiration came from. River Keeper Flies, dear friend of mine in Oregon, John Kareft. And another fellow in Oregon that we'll, we'll talk about, um, Dick Rohrbaugh, those two people were inspirations that put the final touches on the pattern that, that I'm tying today. 
And uh, if you want to, if you are interested in, in joining a really great twice a week blog, Riverkeeper Flies, there's the, the web address. John Kareff sends out this blog. And if you want some incredible photography on what I call on the water bugs, that's what John does incredibly well. And you need to visit that website. But anyway, let's get some. Um, Let's get back to the materials. And these are the materials that we're going to be using. Uh, <clears throat> I think they're, they're pretty much self-explanatory. I'll um, start with um, scud hooks, size 12, however they be, whatever you want them to be. I've got here, you can't tell what that is, but that actually is UV glue, UV light. Antron wool, thread, peacock, hair, thread magic. Right now I'm working on irrigation systems um, for the house here as we get things ready for spring. And my fingers just go to heck when I'm digging around in the mud and all that kind of stuff. And it really makes it tough for tying flies. And of course my hair stacker. And so that before Jay Lee even asks, it's not for sale. You know what? I keep getting these these questions on that. But anyway, let's get back over to the to the vice for a minute. One of the things that I discovered in a presentation by Dick Rohrbaugh that gave me the answer that I had been looking for for years, and I was never quite satisfied with the bug that I fished all the time in Montana in the Spring Creek environments. It was kind of a crippled emerger, whatever the heck you want to call it, was uh, the shuck. Because that shuck would often just kind of spread out in the water and it would be a big tuft of yarn on the back instead of the shape of a body, like the real shucks were that I observed when I was on the water. Well, a little bit of glue right here on the end of that tail, that's nothing more than antron yarn, did the job. The other thing that I learned from Dick Rohrbaugh and uh, had kind of forgotten because it originally got the idea from Gary LaFontaine and that's sparkle. The sparkle represents or, or simulates, if you will, the air bubbles that the insect pumps into the ectoskeleton so it can crawl out. And what we have here right now is the shuck, as you call it, well, that's where this part of the fly right up front here is a part that's crawled out, and we have some bubbles left behind in the exoskeleton there. And that's the thing that I wasn't getting with just plain ordinary yarn. And this has got antron in it, and in the water, it has little glittery, little glitteries, as I call them. So it, it gives you the, the idea. So now there's the bug. Let's go to some of the inspiration things that I went through. First off, I started with John Kreff's website. And he had bugs in the water there. And so I went looking on the internet for a fly that I thought represented what I was looking for. The shuck and the bug crawling out and all that kind of stuff. And this is what I found, okay? And it's from the Fly Fishers group uh, online. Well, I did a little bit of work on it. I took a and did some uh, photoshopping on the wing to give you an idea of where the, where the lump was at and the shuck and all of that. And I put a black line in there to indicate water, the water line. And then I looked at the key features that I could see in this drawing. And that's this right here. This is a, this is a fly, the, the shuck, the legs, the head crawling out, uh, the wings sticking up, the legs, et cetera. And that's how we came to the KX emerger. And I might want to add, I look at emergers and cripples as the same thing. The only difference between an emerger and a cripple is that it, at one stage of the game, the cripple never, never managed to get out of the shuck. The other one's still struggling to get out of the shuck. But quite frankly, the fish looking up at a cripple or, or at an emerger don't see one or the other, they just see dinner. I mean, so it's uh, what that boils down to. Anyhow, back to that. 
And how are we going to tie this guy? Well, it's so easy. I had to do a lot of talking because if you thought Eric's got done quick, uh, wait, don't blink. That's all I can tell you. It's the kind of fly that guides really like a lot because they don't take a lot of time and they're effective. Wait a minute. Before I do this, though, I've got to do one other thing so I don't have to take this out of the vise. So let me just set this aside for a second. Let me reach over to my materials. Whoops, wrong camera. Over to the materials. And let me get my a, a piece of this Antron yarn, and I'll just bring it over to the vise. And I want you to notice that what I've got here is I've got an elbow, is what I call it. You get these every time they fold over a piece of cardboard or, or a part of the packaging process. Now you can straighten that elbow out with a stream of warm air from a hairdryer and it'll just straighten it right out, just slicker in a whistle. Or the other thing you can do with that is cut it off. Buzz it up, uh, cut it a couple of times and mix it in with some hair's ear. And this sparkly little fibers like this mixed in the hair's ear dubbing will give you a treat. Now that's just an extra tip. Don't have a darn thing to do with today. It's just something to do with that fuzzy, fuzzy stuff. Mixed in with your hair's ear makes for really some nice highlights in the dubbing. Set that aside. And let me just stick this in the vise for a minute. I'll reach grab back over here and get my flashlight and my UV. And we'll come back over here. And I'll set that flashlight down, getting it ready to go. And I'm just going to take and twist this like a bunch. Okay, I think you can still see what I'm doing there without my hands getting in the way. I'll just put some UV on there, set that aside, set the UV, and I'm just going to cut that in half there, and I've got two shucks for a size 12, and uh, if I want a size 20, I take and cut this shuck that I'm pointing at now with my scissors into three of these. And of course, uh, the segments will be held together at the end by the little bit, bits of UV glue. So that's one of the things that you can do. Now I'm going to set this aside for the moment and get that hook back in the vise so that we can go ahead and, and start tying the fly. Reaching over for my thread. I'll just set these hooks out of the way. I'm going to need that here in a minute. And I'm going to take my hair stacker and move it over to the tying vise along with the thread. And we'll just attach the thread to the hook. Now, one of the things I like to do is notice that I've got an O-ring on my, on my uh, bobbin holder. That keeps the thread from coming out. I cannot tell you how many times I've come and grab a bobbin, especially after I've got on a plane and fly to a show someplace to do a a fly tying demonstration, all my bobbins have come, had, had come uh, un, undone and I had to restring them all. Well, I don't know what it is about travel. It does that. But anyhow, uh, that's one way I keep them. Now, I never have that trouble anymore. A fellow by the name of Leroy Hyatt does a um, public television uh, fly tying series out of Lewiston, Idaho. And he called me one day about that. And he says, you know, Al, you ought to... You ought to fix that problem that I saw you at the show having the other day. Was We had a show in central Idaho, and he happened to be there. And, and anyway, he gave me that tip, and it was I published it in Fly Tire Magazine. Oh, Jesus. A lot of years ago. This must have been 20 years ago that, that we've been using these, these uh, rubber O-rings. But anyway, I've got just a, a quick application of thread right at the hook eye. We'll get back over here, and we're going to get some of our deer hair <clears throat> and I'll just cut it off and let's get over at the vice again I want to show you a couple of things about this deer hair first off I want you to notice that this this hair 
has got a little bit of a curve in it. Not much, but a little bit. Just enough that it can make it kind of, it doesn't stack well. But you can straighten that. Now, I know most of you who, who've been watching presentations that I do have already seen this. So just yawn a little bit or go get a cup of coffee or whatever while I go through this segment. But what we're going to do is straighten that out so that it, it'll stack really nice. And you do that by taking your thumbnail and your forefinger and putting a series of crimps, just like our brothers and sisters who tie whole dress Atlantic salmon flies do with their um, with the crest on their on their salmon flies. They they adjust the 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 the, the how would I say the length, the span across the hook uh, by putting crimps either on one side or the other so that it will fall in line with the tip of the tail. Anyway, so I've got that pretty well straightened out now. And I need to get rid of the waste that's in here, the, the uh, short fibers and the, uh, I don't know, fur, fud, I just call it junk. Anyway, I'm going to get back out here over my waste bin and to clean that out. I like to keep that cleaned out away from away from the camera because the uh, cameras and fuzz, I don't know, they, for something about them, they just don't get along and it doesn't make for a good presentation to have a bit of fuzz in the middle of your camera lens. Anyway, I'm just putting those fibers into the hair stacker. And I've got those pretty well stacked up. <clears throat> and I think I've got a few too many, so I'm just going to get rid of some of them. And that looks, that looks a little bit better. And I'm going to measure them so they're as long as a complete hook. And just tie them right on top, right at the front, really bailing into it. I'm not trying to be delicate with this in any way at all. Okay. And what I'm doing here is I bind that. This area right here is going to be the head whatever you want to call it of the fly, if it's got a head. I'm just going to trim this at an angle so that I get a severe angle on the cut. And one of the things, I'm going to show you a little trick. One of the things about covering over trimmed hair like that is you end up with what I call the sticky. Let me get a short, a tight view here. Okay, a sticky are these fibers that end up sticking up as you're trying to wrap and you get to poking up in the air on you. Now, I want to back off just a little bit here and show you how to never have stickies again. You take your thumbnail and your forefinger and line them up right with the direction that the thread's going to go on the hook. And you use the thumb. I'm kind of exaggerating here. But you use the thumbnail to guide that thread right into the next turn. And if you don't do that, your hand wiggles. I can't I guarantee you. You're a better person than I am if it doesn't wiggle. But if you'll back off and allow those two fingers to guide the thread, you can just wrap that stuff, moving your fingers back as you go. And then, and one of the things, and I got one sticky that 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 showed up, and I'm just going to get rid of that. One of the things that I've learned over the years, a lot of years as a commercial tire, quite frankly, is it's really tough to get a good looking outer body with a lousy underbody. Not impossible, but it's tough. And then when the fly gets wet, it doesn't look real good anyway, because it's all the lumps and valleys and bad stuff show. Now I'm gonna set this in so that it'll be sticking out about, I don't know, whatever looks right to me. And I'll just tie that on, wrapping back on the hook a ways until it's about where I want it. I got a couple of fibers breaking loose here and okay, that's fine. Now I got a choice of either re-gluing or just leaving them. And I think I'll just leave them. Trim the waist of that. Looking pretty good. Now we're going to Get rid of the last of those. Okay, now I'm going to wrap all the way forward and let's go back to the materials. 
And we're going to just get a, a, a piece of peacock. This is a pretty sh short application, so one strand of peacock will do the job. And I'll just, I've taken quite a few off of this side over here, so I'll just grab some off of here so that I can kind of eventually get the two sides caught up with each other. Now we'll get back over here, and I'm just going to tie that on the hook by the tip right here at the front. And trim the waist, pull this around, and I'm going to grab the thread and the peacock together and just start wrapping from front to back. And what I'm doing is building peacock chenille, twisting the fibers or the peacock around the thread as I wrap towards the back. Now I want a nice full thorax, whatever you want to call this fly. Uh, but I'm not caring too much about the back part. In fact, I want the back part to be really rough. So the way we used to tie them for the spring creeks when I was when I was guiding those spring creeks uh, out of Livingston. And you notice that uh, the application of the peacock that I've got here behind the thorax area is a lot ruggeder, if that is even a word, than it is right there in the thorax area. So let me trim this off. And I'm just going to rib with my thread over that and stop right there at the back of the thorax area, fold over the head, wing, whatever you want to call all of this, tie it off. And I'm going to just kind of pull it up a bit because I don't know if you've spent any time uh, on spring creeks, but let's talk about this for a bit. I cannot tell you the hours that I spent on a spring creek. Fly fisher on this side, casting, guide on the other side, over here, over there, you know, this kind of stuff. And one of the things about that, that kind of a situation is you get to observe what's happening on the water a lot. You're not doing any fishing. You're not having to fiddle with a rod. You're just spotting things for your customer. But you're also learning stuff. And when, a, when an insect hatches. I've seen these insects float by me on the spring creeks. Go by you and you'll see the little bit of the shuck sticking out and you'll see this blob on top of the shuck. A little bit of sparkle in the shuck. Probably the air bubbles. I didn't even think about that until that uh, presentation recently by Dick Rohrbaugh where he was talking about the same thing but he was in referencing to midges. But anyway, but that's the way they, that's the way they hatch. And in watching all that, that hatching, that's that's where we came up with this. Now let me get back to the to the fly. I get I get myself waylaid, and sometimes I forget where I'm going, and and that's uh, that's not good. But it's also one of the things that just goes along with age. So now let me get back over to the materials, and I've got some rubber leg material here in this clip. Let's just get over here so you can see it because getting rubber leg material of this size is not easy. I mean, it's not impossible to get, but this isn't your standard rubber leg, size rubber legs. So let me just uh, get ready to tie this on. And you notice that back here, uh, right, uh, right there, the rubber legs are pretty close together in, as far as length. I cannot tell you how many times I have watched people tie their rubber legs on. They'll tie one on this side, cinch it down, then they'll tie one on the other side and cinch it down, <clears throat> and then spend some time trimming them because they didn't come out even when they're already even. Just stick them through the thread. Decide how long you want them back there. And then you take one and, and pull it back over to the other side. And the other one back over to, to the near side. Whoops, that got away from me. Well, that wasn't what was planned, folks, but that's what happens sometimes during a live demonstration. Anyway, that putting them on one side and moving them over, I learned from a young fly tire at a show in Logan, Utah, he was a, a, a high school student who uh, spent his summers tying for this, for this shop and doing some guiding. And 
He's the one that showed me how to do that. He didn't even know it. He was just tying flies next to me at a show. I watched and I learned. Anyway, I want you to notice that when I when I trimmed on this fly, what I did is I wanted to make sure that the legs in the back, well, that leg's too long. I kind of screwed up when I lost that leg because this is a leg that was just the perfect, perfect length. I want the legs back here a little bit longer than the legs up front. And why is that? Well, if you look how the those bugs set on the water, they've got those the legs that kind of set back to stabilize the bug that seem to be shorter, even though they're they're back here closer to the body. And then there's the ones out front that uh, provide the stabilization in the front of the fly. Anyway, so let me tie this off. All right, set that down, trim off the waist. And there we've got um, the KX Emerger. Now, what is the KX Emerger? Well, the K comes from my buddy John Kreft, whose photography gave me the inspiration on actually changing this pattern. And it was uh, the, that he and uh, Richard Rohrbaugh from Oregon there that... Uh, gave the inspiration for getting the bubbles in, in the shuck. And the X, the original pattern didn't have the rubber legs on them. It was only when I recently found this really fine rubber leg material that I uh, started tying them with uh, rubber legs on them. And that's the one thing that I don't know if it'll make any difference or not. But I want you to notice that uh, that rubber leg material still looks pretty cool, even on a size uh, 18. I don't know. I think it'll stable, stabilize the fly. And if not, I'm kidding myself. And then that's fine too. And questions. Let's see. Somebody has written in there your thoughts of gold versus brown shuck. Yeah. I have no feelings about it. Most of the stuff I seem to th thought I saw in the spring creeks. And, and I'm referencing mostly the spring creeks around Livingston as well as the backwaters of the Missouri and the Madison. Uh, that I, I saw, they were kind of a brownish color. <clears throat> and let's see, John Wright says, can you use stretchy thread for the legs? I don't know, does, if stretchy thread holds together, I don't know why not. But most of the stretchy thread that I've seen kind of fuzzes apart, so I don't know. And uh, any comments, concerns, whatever. Neil, Neil had a question about uh, wanting to know what you what you use to stick the legs together, I think is that right, Neil? Yes, sir. I don't. Uh, what do I use to stick the legs together? I don't understand. It looked like you had the legs adhered to one another as you as you put them on. Uh, they, they, had, they had just uh, they had been in this clip uh, right next to each other, so. Uh, no, they weren't stuck together. It just may, may have looked that way. I held them together as I slipped them up around and I lost one. And yeah. Got it. I thought you had something holding them together. I No, I, I sure it. didn't. You were very observant, but yeah. but it wasn't what was high, happening, happening at all. Very nice looking fly. I like that. Um, Lou Duncan has promised to test this fly for me because I... I showed this to Lou uh, a while back in another presentation. And so I'm expecting a report as the spring unfolds. And I hope to get to the Henry's Fork for opening of the railroad ranch in, in uh, mid-June uh, and try this fly. But I wanted to comment, uh, Eric talked about the railroad ranch. And I don't know if some of you other guys that have fished the ranch have ever noticed this phenomenon, but it has proven terribly effective for me. Okay, so you're you're sitting on the Henry's fork, the water's gliding by, and there's a little bubble comes up to the surface, and then it spreads out as it floats downstream. And then you wait a while, and pretty soon a little bubble comes up, and it spread, it, it's uh, about so big around, and then it just spreads out as it goes down the water. Wow. Well, I, I just sat there false casting, waiting for a bubble to show up. And as soon as that bubble shows up and it's within my casting range, um, 
I'll just land my fly right in the middle of that. And I've got about a six to eight foot drift, perfect, because the edge of that ring grabs my leader and takes that fly along, and I get incredible dead drifts. And I don't know what causes those bubbles. I've only seen it on the Henry's Fork. But I'll tell you what, it is a killer. And one of my favorite flies on the Henry's Fork, I hate to tell you this, it's going to make you all mad because you're trying to imitate stuff. I do better with a number 20 Royal Wolf than anything. So, tuck away all you want. I have the Spring Creek. I was guiding a customer from um, Pennsylvania, and, and I won't say any more other than I was guiding him on Armstrong's that particular day. And he was having pretty good luck. <clears throat> and he said, would you like to fish a bit? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I can fish a bit. And uh, he said, well, what are you going to use? I said, well, I usually fish this Spring Creek uh, with uh, a couple of uh, these emergers, or uh, I always have really good luck with a small royal wolf. I'll start with an 18. If the fish come up and look at it and then turn away, what you do is you want to go to a smaller size. And so I put on a, an 18. And a couple of fish came up and looked at it. So I said, oh. so I went down and I put on a size 22 royal wolf. Had phenomenal. That guy walked away and I, I got a big order of royal wolves from him. Or let me rephrase. <laughs> I got a large order of small royal wolves from him, and ended up, ended up sending him to there, him there in Pennsylvania. But anyway, do not discount a good presentation, and show the fish something just slightly different than they're used to seeing. And they ain't seen royal wolves on the spring creeks. I'll tell you that right now. Just, that, this this story is great, and I had a, a similar story myself. I'm going to uh, spotlight you so we're side by side, Eric. Okay. Do this. I had a, a similar story on 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 the Missouri side channels. There were nothing but pseudos and pseudos. You never know what to throw for pseudos. And so, I asked at the fly shop. I mean, I was desperate. We had tried various things, and. Uh, the guy at the fly shop said, throw a number 20 or 22 um, parachute atoms. And I'm thinking, you know, all right, uh, parachute atoms. Lo and behold, that night banged a fabulous trout with, with a, a 22 parachute atoms. So... You know, you think a lot of these flies, they've seen one too many times, or uh, Brand Betters, of course, was uh, in the North Country, was a huge believer. And the last time I saw him in his shop, he was tying number 20 parachute, uh, parach Royal Wolf, par uh, not parachute, Royal Wolves, number 20, just like Al's talking about for the uh, Sable, for the West Branch of the uh, Sable. The, um, another story going in the exact opposite direction is I was guiding another uh, a couple of fellows in Yellowstone Park on Slough Creek. And we'd come into this one section of Slough Creek below the, uh, below the meadow. And the fish in there were just, just steadily coming up and sipping and coming up and sipping. And, and you could see that they were feeding on some pretty small mayflies. And so they started offering these long tippets and little bitty mayflies, and the fish would come up and look at them, and the fish would look up there at that and say, hey, George, that'll look like it's got the right number of turns of hackle on it, and then sink back to the bottom. I'm joking about the turns of hackle. You understand, though, that fish looked it over real good and just sink right down. And this went on for like two hours. Well, it, it, what these guys didn't know is that the first part of the day, when the wife delivered the son and the father, they said, I, I want you to understand, guide. She knew my name. I don't remember her name. But she said, I want you to understand, we have a dinner at 7 o'clock, and they have to be back for that. Okay, okay. So here we are. This is going to be 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and they haven't hardly touched the fish. Fish coming up and looking, sinking down, coming up and looking, sinking down. So finally I said to the guy, I said, would you like to catch a couple of fish before we leave? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, cut that long tip it off. And I pulled out a number four black zonker, swung it through there. And on the first swing through, he just nailed a fish. 
And so I got to him and the kid both into black zonkers. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes all you got to do is show the fish something different, something different than you're used to seeing. You know, I just, but one of the many things that there's, you're one of your friends on here tonight or this afternoon, Eric, is a, is a guide that you've guided with. And I'm sure that he could probably chime in with a story or two himself. I'm sure uh, Charlie's got plenty of stories. I know Charlie. Mr. L, when you have a moment, would it be okay if I ask you a question about your uh, the fly you just tied? Uh, yeah, you betcha. Um, obviously, with the, uh, the computer issues I had, I missed the first portion of it. And I, I see the... Mm -hmm. uh, the shuck or body of the fly looks to be either poly or antron, and I'm not sure which it is. Do you typically fish this fly uh, as a single style and merger or, or midge pattern, or, or do you usually use a dropper off the back of this and, uh, you know, fish it in tandem with something else? How do you uh, prefer I, to fish the, the pattern? Long tippet, spring creeks, one fly. Uh, it's, I've never had a lot of success trying to do a double fly rig up on the spring right. creeks. I mean, when you're talking about spring creek, you're talking about water that just barely flows. The fish have plenty of time to see it. I just not had much success. I mean, it's the Yellowstone and the spring creeks adjacent to the Yellowstone. It's not uncommon to, for when I was guiding people to pull up on the bank, have lunch. And just over the, just over the bank was the spring creeks. And on this side was the Yellowstone. I mean, if you were fishing in the Yellowstone, it was large caddis with a with a bead headed dropper underneath, and uh, you crawl, you climb right up over the bank, and you're in the spring creeks. And boy, if you weren't size twenty and smaller on a long tippet, you just weren't fishing. So no, you weren't particularly prospecting with this. This is something that you would you would more precision casting. So you're watching for eyes and fish and targeting specific fish. You're exactly. Not okay. Exactly. I'm, yes, sir. Charlie's got his hand raised. Thank you, Charlie. That way I can find you. I'm going to add you as a spotlight if that's okay with you. And you can then unmute yourself and chat a little bit about your experiences. Yeah, Charlie, the because Charlie, tell, tell them guide, how, we'd love to hear from you. Tell them how you managed to get me into fish <laughs> somehow. You know, I think it was it was luck more than anything because, uh, but 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 the story was great with uh, with, with with Rick. Um, you had just come out. My God, Rick! It's been twenty twenty six years. It's been twenty six years, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So we got into we, we were fishing the gunpowder. I think it was kind of mid March. Was it Rick? It was mid March, and Bruce Copeland and I. It was early. Yeah. It was early, and um, and I believe we started to get these little, I think it was Hendrickson's, I just can't remember what was coming up, these little things, and we started just sweeping wet flies because nothing was was really biting, and um, uh, Rick says I was guiding him. I, I was just really right next to him saying, okay, let's try this, let's try There's not not much there, but we, we were swinging wet flies, and, and for what it's worth, I, I've always thought wet flies are not given the, uh, the the attention they deserve, you know, in terms of uh, seems to be more of an old school thing, but, uh, but, but wet flies just can be so, so, so deadly. I, I would imagine you, you all have your experiences with it, but um, this is more emotional, but it's, I can't believe we're seeing each other after 26 years and uh, it's great to see everybody. And Al, I had a question on that. What was the reason on this last fly that you tied? What was the reason that, you tied the portion behind the thorax, the peacock girl, you wrapped it in with the thread. Is there a specific reason for that or just to strengthen it or make it it's, more? It strengthens it. And it, it also, the way you do that, you can either build it full or you can really cinch down on it and make it rugged. And you, it was very rugged at the back half and full in the thorax half. Yeah. And it's just, by you know, and you probably have tied quite a bit. You know that when you really cinch down on it, you're, you're really uh, taking a lot of twists into that, and when you make when you're loose, it's you're letting the twist slip a little bit. So this hopefully Rick will join us, but we're going to the Henry's Fork in July, and I had never ever heard of anybody pulling out a royal wolf on on the Henry's Fork. I think that's fascinating, you know. Well, and I'm definitely going to do it. <laughs> be sure, you know. And another thing, my theory. 
on the as an example the parachute atoms still a, an incredible fly here in the west probably in the east too though i've never fished it in the east but in the in last years you know maybe the last 10 years uh, a fly called the purple haze which is nothing more than a purple bodied atoms is is a uh, a fly that is at least have some mention uh if not a pretty darn good pattern to have in your fly box and i i say again it's the same thing show the fish something they want to see but slightly different and it, it, if nothing else i don't know whether it's curiosity or not being gun shy at that new color or the different design or what i don't know what it is but by the way i i have a comment on the henry's fork uh early uh, i uh, last time i fished the henry's fork um I wasn't breathing well and I had a lot of physical problems. I still do, but anyhow, um, early in the day there, I had seen a, a, a fish rise and I had covered it with some PMDs and, and no, didn't, it didn't take. And later that day, my friend Tom Wilson said to me, Hey, I just saw a green Drake. So I thought, well, I'm going to put a green drake on and and put it over where I saw that fish rise earlier today. And lo and behold, got a, a, a big boy to the point that he got off. You know, I, I, I did not land that fish um, and slammed it the first drift over him. So you, I had always understood that you could not blind fish at Henry's Fork. Well, you can if you've, if you've seen a rise earlier in the day. And then if if something something comes off that they really want to see, like they love the green drakes and the brown drakes, uh, try that. I've got yeah, a great sure. story. If uh, Eric, can you hear me? Yeah, love to hear. Uh, I think I could. Is that, is, is that Dick you. speaking? Yeah, Dick Shaw. Okay, let me get you up here, Dick. Pardon me? Okay, let's see. Add spotlight. Oh, there we go. There you go. Uh, a couple of years ago, up on the Alsaba in Michigan, I uh, fished the, the uh, last chance triple. Uh, I had just learned to tie it and uh, thought it was a, a beautiful fly. It might be fun to fish. And it was a really slow day. The fish weren't where they typically are in the cover along either bank. So I put one right down the middle of the stream, a long cast. And much to my surprise and, and delight, a swallow came down and picked it up. <laughs> in all of the years of dry fly fishing, I'd never, ever had a bird come down and take my fly. And it was such a compliment that that had to be a hell of a good tie. Did he give you a good tug? Well, he got up about two feet off the water and decided something was wrong and, <laughs> and dropped I, it. So. I, I caught a bat one, one evening uh, fishing a lake on a on a bat cast. And I gave it a couple of tugs, you know, and it was flying around up there and and uh, it, it came off. But I mean, I'm just that was kind of a stunner. Well, it's still a great fly, and I, I, I like Eric's pattern. I had not seen that before, and uh, as, uh, as sparse as that is, <clears throat> delicate, it looks like a good fly. Well, anyway, what I'm going to do now is uh, the chat section that we always go to. I think we've pretty well uh, got this episode out to where we can just kind of now include everyone into the into the presentation. So I am going to uh, let's see what am I doing here? Remove spotlight. Remove spotlight. Get everybody back so that we're all <clears throat> we all can talk and and now we're just a group of people talking, and anybody that wants to chime in surely can. I see Sherry joined us. Hey, Sherry, welcome. Hi, Sherry. 
you're you're muted, Sherry. Anyway, I got an email from Sherry today. She uh, dis <coughs> disassembled her, her Zoom studio to go to a show. And so I get this email back from Sherry. She says, help, how do I put this thing back together? Well, in the time it took me to answer the email, I get another one from her. It says, oh, I figured it out. I figured it out. So anyway, it's I'm always good to have a friend in the back in the background you can turn to for help. Yeah, I'm speaking tomorrow night, and I, I just thought oh, I'll just put it back together. And and uh, I usually don't teach the guild classes. I have all these other instructors. And I go, oh, I'm going to teach this one. And and then I couldn't get my camera to work. And I go, wait a second. It's called Plug It In yeah. The Right Place. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Just, just for my people who don't know Sherry, uh, Sherry, Sherry's just a wonderful teacher. Uh, I've, I've caught a couple of her things, and and Sherry, I apologize. I haven't, I haven't been following your latest series, and but I will get there. Yeah, time is precious. Well, yeah. uh, so nothing but doctor's appointments. It seems like it's crazy. Yeah. Well, we've only got uh, my class Thursday and then one more class. And then I'm going <clears> to <throat> wrap it up for uh, the winter series and go fishing for the summer. God, that sounds like an awful thing to have to live through. She I know. Lives about, you know she, these... lives about, uh, <laughs> she lives about three steps away from some of the most beautiful water in Oregon. So, Yeah, fishing in Metolius. Yep. Yeah. Gentlemen, well, folks, before, we, before we get oh. off, I'd like to... Uh, to tell Eric something, if that's okay, and you as well, Mr. Absolutely, Rowe. you go right ahead. Uh, Eric, I don't recall, or I don't know if you'll, if you will recall, I sent you an email about uh, three or four months ago. Um, you had just recently moved. I, I kind of, I've, I've known uh, about Al for quite some time. I've got several, uh, several books that I'd love to bring around and, and, and milk his brain on, but I, I just, Miraculously, um, I believe there was a Project Healing Waters event, and somebody had mentioned your name, and I, I happened to stumble across you on YouTube. And uh, there was about a span during during COVID of roughly a, a year long when uh, you were in the process of your move. I know you had some some family um, issues you were trying to deal with, and uh, I, I really was concerned enough that that I reached out and just wanted to make sure that. Uh, that you were still around and let you know that there were a lot of us that that you personally helped develop our skills and skill sets through your uh, through a lot of the videos that you had done. And, and I just I know I've said it, um, you know, some of the other videos that you guys posted to Facebook doing these uh, Zoom meetings that um, that it's appreciated. And, and I, I'm truly excited to see you back. And, and uh, I try to take as much of this um, in as I can. This has truly saved my life. Um, when I came back from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, I, I wound up with a uh, combat injury that, that changed my life forever. And I'm a young man to be retired. I, I would much rather be working and, um, you know, it, it, doing the best for my family that I could. But I look at this as a, a, a second shot, a second chance given to me by God. Time is, uh, is is incredibly short and so um i have used this as a my fly tying and fly fishing when when i'm able has become my therapy and it's it's gentlemen like you that pass on these lessons that have uh sped up the learning process and and really shortened the learning curve for guys like me and, and it means a lot it, it is uh it is truly something that that i look forward to and um and I just wanted to thank you guys for what you do. Um, each one of these Zoom meetings that I can jump on or that somebody's able to see, it may be more than just a lesson. It may be motivation to, to keep hoping for the next day. And so I, I'm very grateful and gracious for, for both of you taking your, your time, the resources, the money you've spent um, to do this for us. And, and uh, I'm sure many of us feel the same way. Well, well, Mike, I, I, thank you. I think Al and I are both honored by your your comments. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, that was really good, really yeah. good. I love it. Each one of thank you that you teach, Mike. you know, one of us guys, we're we're. I, 
more than grateful. Like I said, I stepped in um, and tried to uh, to fill in as a lead for the Knoxville East Tennessee uh, Project Healing Waters for for some time before I moved to the uh, to the Driftless region. Um, and I just uh, I absolutely am infatuated with an obsession is probably not even a, a good enough word with the, the art of fly tying and fly fishing. And and I'm not sure which I like the most at this at this point, but uh, I, I'm grateful to, to folks that have the knowledge to pass that on to uh, to the, the new ones getting into the sport. So thank you, each and every one of you. Well, I, I think I, I can speak for all, Sherry and Al and those of us that do this stuff. Um, we've all had teachers through the years. Uh, we've all watched countless YouTube videos and uh, no, no, nobody's just we just didn't show up and uh, oh hey look I can tie a fly it's uh, you know a lot of years of learning from others uh, and so it's just it's all part of it I mean and uh, now you know now we're in a position where we can we we can give a little bit here one of the things that I find interesting is that I had been a commercial fly tire for over 20 years when I went to my first fly fishing show after moving to Idaho and discovering the Federation of Fly Fishers. And Wayne Llewellyn was the first fly tire that I saw at a at a show. And I, I was just stunned. I mean, because I already had 20 years experience meeting customer needs and cranking out bugs and thought I was pretty darn good and then found out that I didn't know a darn thing. But I got me started down a road of learning from people. And when I finally felt that I was at the point that I could share something with people, I started traveling to these shows. Now, let, let's talk about some dollars and cents about, about this. We do this for the love of it, to share it with all of you. The last show that I went to, it was an in-person show the last year before COVID. Gretchen and I traveled to it. We had someone host us so we didn't have to pay for a room and we got uh, almost $3,500 in travel expenses. So you're talking about us getting together, Eric and I, and sharing an afternoon with you. And we have probably between us a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment in the Zoom studio. Absolutely. But like we're we're going to end up meeting and, and helping people besides you, people on Facebook, people on YouTube. And quite frankly, it don't cost nearly as much as it did when we traveled to an in-person show. And we only got to have maybe 20 or 30 people across the table from us. Now it's across the airwaves with hundreds. So I, I think it's uh, it's good for you and it's good for us. Yeah, that's why I started it in 2020 uh, when I had to cancel the expo in Albany. <clears throat> I said, you know, we can't. I can't just leave these guys high and dry. And I said, I'm going to learn how to do this Zoom thing. And Al was my mentor, and we bought equipment, and some of it worked, and most of it didn't. And then it then it started working. Yeah. <laughs> and one all of the we things, went. one of the things you guys want to do if you get a chance is go out looking for a thing called Sherry's Hackle Handle. Oh yeah, See what you can find on YouTube. All I can tell you is. Do it. You'll be glad you did. Leave it at that. Well, thank you. Well, it, you're going to keep up with night. it. I, you I, know if you I, I, used, I used Sherry's hackle handle uh, on one of my demos for sure. Um, I, I think it was, uh, you know, you talk about East meets West. I think it was a Carrie Stevens fly. Uh, I used I used that handle to good effect. Interesting. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, you go out and, and look for that. You'll find it, or we'll have Sherry at a future date demonstrating Sherry's hackle handle here on East Meets West. But anyway, if there's not any more comments, I'm getting ready to do the wrap. I need this for the, I need the next few uh, bit of segment segments for the uh, recording. So let me get that taken care of. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. For now, it's a wrap. Until next time, see ya.